Thank you for standing by. This is the conference operator. Welcome to the year and 2020 results conference call for Canadian Utilities Limited. As a reminder, all participants are in listen-only mode and the conference is being recorded. After the presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To join the question queue, you may press star then 1 on your telephone keypad. Should you need assistance during the conference call, you may signal an operator by pressing star and 0. I would now like to turn the conference over to Mr. Miles Dugan, Director, Investor Relations and External Disclosure. Please go ahead, Mr. Dugan. Thank you, Anastasia, and good morning, everyone. We're pleased you could join us for our fourth quarter 2020 conference call. With me today is Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, Dennis de Champlain. Dennis will begin today with some opening comments on his on recent company developments and our financial results. Following his prepared remarks, we will take questions from the investment community. Please note that a replay of the conference call and a transcript will be available on our website at canadianutilities.com and can be found in the investors section under the heading events and presentations. I'd like to remind you all that our remarks today will include forward-looking statements that are subject to important risks and uncertainties. For more information on these risks and uncertainties, please see the reports filed by Canadian Securities, uh, by Canadian Utilities with Canadian Securities Regulators. And finally, I'd also like to point out that during this presentation, we may refer to certain non-GAAP measures, such as adjusted earnings, adjusted earnings per share, funds generated by operations, and capital investment. These measures do not have any standardized meaning under IFRS, and as a result, they may not be comparable to similar measures presented in other entities. And now, I'll turn the call over to Dennis for his opening remarks. Thanks, Miles, and good morning, everyone. Thank you all very much for joining us today on our fourth quarter 2020 conference call. I'd like to begin by talking about our performance in 2020, then our capital investment outlook, and lastly, our sustainable growth direction for the future. As most of you are aware, our investments are largely focused on regulated utilities and long-term contracted businesses with strong counterparties. Over the years, we've created a resilient investment portfolio able to withstand turbulent economic conditions, and 2020 sure had its share of turbulence. Our Australian natural gas utility entered a regulatory reset year with a much lower approved return on equity and severe financial headwinds as a result of a slowing economy due to the COVID-19 pandemic. We also lowered our 2020 capital investments in the year by $300 million as a response to the slowing economic activity. While we experienced a softening in our capital investments this year and slowing activity in some of our businesses, Overall, Canadian utilities continued to generate strong earnings and cash flows. Overall, the slowing global economic activity did not have a significant impact on our operations and financial performance. On a normalized basis, excluding the foregone earnings from the businesses we sold in 2019, Canadian utilities earnings in 2020 were $535 million or $14 million higher compared to 2019. Our resilient financial performance is a testament to our business model, as well as our people who remain focused on continuing to deliver reliable service to our customers. They face considerable operational challenges of working in these new pandemic conditions with courage and dedication and performed in an exemplary fashion. Our 2020 earnings were buoyed by initial earnings from the Puerto Rico contract that I'll talk about more in a minute, as well as continued excellent performance from our distribution utilities operating in their third year of PBR2's five-year plan. Their performance, along with continued improvements in our cost structure across all of our businesses, were able to overcome the headwinds experienced in Australia and electricity transmission which transitioned from capital to operating activities on Alberta Powerline. Our focus on operational excellence has been a key driver in creating a more innovative culture that has empowered our people to find new and more meaningful ways to meet the needs of our customers. 
In doing so, we have continued to improve our overall cost structure, thereby providing premium returns on equity for our investors and long-term benefits for our customers. That commitment was a key factor in our successful 2020 bid for a 15-year contract to operate Puerto Rico's electricity transmission and distribution utility. This fits with Canadian Utilities' growth strategy in the U.S. and Latin America and allows us to bring our core competencies of operational excellence and exceptional customer service for the benefit of Puerto Rico. Going forward in our Australia and our Alberta utilities, we expect to invest $3.2 billion in capital growth projects over the next three years. This capital investment is expected to generate growth in our utility asset base of approximately 2% per year which is a leading indicator of the growth trend of our utilities. Our regulated utility operations are our largest contributor to earnings and will remain so for many years to come. Regarding developments on the regulatory front, in October, the Alberta Utilities Commission issued a decision on the Generic Cost of Capital, or GCOC, approving the current 8.5% return on equity and a capital structure of 30% equity on a final basis for 2021. The AUC commenced a new GCOC process in early 2021 to address the ROE and equity thickness for 2022 and beyond. Our hope, and quite frankly expectation, is that this will be resolved this year so we maintain prospectivity and avoid regulatory lag heading into 2022. We are waiting on two regulatory decisions addressing our electricity transmission and natural gas transmission general rate applications. We expect decisions on both proceedings later in this first quarter of 2021. Natural gas transmission also entered into an agreement in September to acquire 100 kilometers of the Pioneer Pipeline here in Alberta for a net purchase price of $200 million. The transaction is subject to regulatory approvals by the AUC and the Alberta Energy Regulator, which are expected in the second quarter of 2021. While we continue to invest in our core utility businesses to generate stable earnings and reliable cash flows, we recognize that a collaborative and long-term approach to minimizing our environmental footprint is vital. We continue to explore new and more efficient ways to generate, distribute, and conserve energy. Most notably, in 2019, we divested our entire Canadian fossil fuel-based electricity generation business to eliminate coal-fired electricity from our portfolio and significantly reduced our greenhouse gas emissions by almost 90% from 2019 to 2020. We see a shift to cleaner energy and we are well positioned to participate in the development of clean fuels, such as hydrogen, and renewable energy infrastructure investment. In Australia, we're focused on the shift to renewables. We also believe that we can have a meaningful role in the transmission and interconnection of renewable energy to the grid as Australia expands its renewable generation capacity. In Latin America, we're focused on energy infrastructure, particularly renewable generation. We also to continue to pursue various other business development opportunities with long-term potential here in our home market of Alberta, as well as in our other target markets. To achieve this growth strategy, we're focused on three aspects. First, we will continue investing in our rate-regulated business to generate stable, reliable cash flow and adapt to changing utility customer preferences. Second, we will drive forward renewables and clean fuels as clean growth priorities to supplement our base regulated business. And third, we may use smaller scale acquisitions to accelerate growth opportunistically, but we do not intend to invest in transformational M&A in the near term. That concludes my prepared remarks and I'll turn the call back over to Miles. Well, thanks very much, Dennis. And um, now we'll turn the call over to the conference coordinator for investor questions. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. In the interest of time, we ask you to limit yourselves to two questions. If you have additional questions, you are welcome to rejoin the queue. 
to join the question queue, you may press star then 1 on your telephone keypad. You will hear a tone acknowledging your request. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing any keys. To withdraw, your, uh, to withdraw from the question queue, please press star then 2. Webcast participants are welcome to click on the Submit Question tab near the top of the webcast frame and type their question. The Canadian Utilities Investor Relations team will follow up with you by email after the call. Once again, anyone on the conference call who wishes to ask a question may press star 1 at this time. The first question comes from Linda Ezergailis with TD Securities. Please go ahead. Thank you. Congratulations for navigating a challenging year very successfully. I'm, I'm wondering if you can um, help us understand um, the decision-making behind um, the Master Services Agreement with IBM, uh, the one-time charge to terminate your prior uh, agreement with your prior or your current vendor, um, and what, how that might translate into innovative new um, efficiencies, process changes, uh, and, and when and where we might see that in your operation. Uh, thank you, Linda. Yeah, the, uh, the decision to terminate the contract with uh, Wipro was, was definitely not done lightly. We, we really do believe that this new arrangement with IBM gives, is the right path to, re to meet the needs of our business moving forward. We really do require an IT solution that provides a platform for growth and innovation, uh, increasing our use of cloud, uh, artificial intelligence, as well as automation. So that's the, uh, the strategic rationale be behind the switch. Um, One-time charge you, you see in, in the uh, accounts uh, backed out for adjusted earnings. Um, in terms of, your, uh, of the innovation uh, question and time frame, there is a, a six-month transition from Wipro over to IBM. It commenced February 1, so IBM, in essence, will get the keys um, to the uh, operating systems um, in August of this year. That's the plan. And when will we? When do we expect to see uh, performance from that uh, from that change in vendor? We really do believe that that acceleration to cloud will result in tangible benefits. It'll be hard to see them in 2021, but they should start to appear in 2022. That's helpful context, thank you. And maybe switching over to your uh, utility distribution businesses, uh, can you talk about now that you've seen a full year, um, you know, uh, how the uh, industrial and commercial customer base volumes were impacted by the pandemic and whether or not that might tri trigger some sort of um, uh, mitigation through uh, uh, filing for a Z factor event. Uh, yeah, we do have. Uh, a thanks, uh, a great question, Linda. I mean, we, we do have the uh, those volumes in the in the AIF. I don't have them uh, at my, at my fingertips. Um, we've been saying all along, and there's really no change on gas distribution. Uh, we don't expect uh, Z factor. On the electricity side, we are kind of a bumping our heads right up to that. Um, it's about a three and a half million dollar uh, trigger for Z Factor, but where we stand right now, it doesn't look like we'll be filing a Z Factor. There's no recovery um, in 2020 associated with that. But I'm going to say it's doubtful that we'll be recovering or we'll be applying for any Z Factor for electricity distribution. They haven't completed the final analysis yet, but uh, uh, in any event, it would be uh, relatively small dollars. So the, um, those volumes really, really hung in there on the electricity distribution side. We, um, uh, not maybe not surprising, but uh, we did think that the capital would come off more than what it did, but we continued to see uh, customers um, come to us looking for um, hook up to the electricity system, so it um, we we really did weather that uh, that, that COVID I'll say waves one and two um, extremely well. 
Thank you. And just as a, another follow-up uh, question, looking at uh, the next couple of years, um, I see that your incentive fees um, um, kind of escalate uh, over your Luma contract, energy contract. I'm wondering uh, what the what the uh, performance hurdles are uh, to uh, get to the maximum amount, and uh, what is the performance hurdle to get any amount? I guess the bookends of of when you might realize an incentive and when you might book it. Yeah. Um, these uh, performance uh, metrics, they're all uh, outlined in the, in the contract. The parameters, however, have not been finalized yet. We just lodged our um, uh, filings, we'll call them the, we'll call them the big three um, filings with the uh, Puerto Rico Electricity Bureau or the PREB there. Um, one of one of them is initial budgets. You know we're applying for no rate increase. Uh, the next one is on a system remediation plan that we have for uh, for the island's electricity system, and the third one is on those performance metrics, where we've uh, submitted the those uh, uh, amounts that we believe where the bar should be set. That's going to go through uh, approximately a 90-day process. And then we'll uh, we'll be in a better position to be able to uh, answer the question as to uh, the quantum and timing for any uh, uh, incentive fees coming out of that that contract. The regulatory decision from the PREB, and they're on their uh, kind of a 90-day <clears throat> clock now, is a condition precedent for coming out of the transition. Um, timeline and moving into uh, into the contract years. That, that's helpful context. Thank you. I'll jump back in the queue. Thanks, Linda. The next question comes from Mark Jarvie with CIBC. Please go ahead. Great. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Um, wanted to talk about Australia. Maybe Dennis can comment a little bit about that pumped hydro project that you seem to be involved in now and, and maybe just dovetail that with your comments around looking at opportunities around electric transmission in Australia in terms of what that size, scope, style, the economic framework for transmission opportunities might be. Um, uh, thanks, Mark. Yeah, that um, I, I'm going to say it's uh, very, very early days on that uh, that pumped hydro project. You know, it's uh, there are clear signals forming in the market that this type of product is going to be required as renewables. Uh, penetrate and escalate their share of uh, generation as their as their coal comes off. You know we were I'm going to say a couple of years out for making a final investment decision. You know that you know we're anticipating early 2023 and uh, commercial operations uh, pending uh, FID would be a few years after that. So we're looking at 2026 as to uh, you know when that uh, that, that could um, uh, deliver earnings. You know it's a 325 megawatts, approximately 500 million dollar uh, development. Um, so we uh, we believe that's um, kind of in in our in our wheelhouse as we as we move as sorry as we after we disposed of our Canadian fossil fuel and moving into uh, the renewable electricity generation. Uh, you also mentioned uh, the transmission, um, and that uh, is is firmly in our uh, expertise coming off of successful projects like the West Fort McMurray transmission development, EDL. And before that, the uh, Hanna Region Transmission Development. So we've, um, I think, we've really honed our craft with respect to um, that long transmission, long linear projects, and to help get that uh, renewable energy to market in Eastern Australia. You know, we've been, uh, we've been, we've got our critical mass, we'll say, in Western Australia with our gas business in Perth. But we do have our structures business on uh, kind of on the east coast with uh, manufacturing facilities in Brisbane, so and operations down in the Sydney area as well. So uh, looking to expand that uh, utilities and energy infrastructure portion out from the west into uh, into eastern Australia. So 
we're, uh, we're, we're very excited about the project and it's very early days with a, with a long ways to go, but we're working out just, on her. And, and just to follow up in terms of, you know, the, you need obviously some sort of long-term offtake for the pumped hydro to move forward. And then on the transmission, would these be more like concession type projects or actual ownership of, of, of you know, uh, some permanent uh, regulated utility assets? Um, yeah, on, on the uh, on on the offtake for the for the pumped hydro, you know our uh, our business development and sales teams will be looking to contract for a significant portion um, of that uh, asset as we move in move forward to to making uh, FID. On the transmission side, uh, it's looking more like a, an ownership model that uh, that we would charge a kind of a get a capacity charge or uh, based on a on a regulated rate okay and then one, one question in terms of of the results in the quarter the natural gas distribution utility performed quite well you know really strong year over year there's some commentary about some timing of cost can you just maybe outline what drove the, the strong year over year performance and if the timing of cost is because you already incurred them in prior quarters or you deferred this quarter and, and, you, and you'll have to incur those in, in subsequent quarters um, a lot, a lot of the, uh, the 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 boost to the earnings in our natural g gas distribution business, you know, it's a we'll say a combination of operating and uh, and capital efficiencies. If you recall the um, PBR two, the revenue bakes in a notional three hundred million dollars uh, per year in capital. And while we're operating safely and reliably uh, at a lower capex, uh, those savings compound and are really starting to deliver, we'll call it um, kind of uh, material in-year savings. Of course, when we go to rebase coming out of PBR2 into uh, PBR3 or the next version of, uh, of regulatory, that lower rate base will... Uh, will result in lower charges which flow through to customers so there's a lot of the uh, a lot of the upsides uh, associated with the uh, capital uh, improvements and then also on the operating end of it i'm going to say there's uh, uh, numerous uh, small initiatives that are amounting to the to those costs or cost savings the timing element we uh, we're really catching up. Hang on a second. Where am I going here? Uh, sorry, I've uh, blanked out here on on your mark for the uh, for the timing of the operating costs. That's all right. We, we could follow up if you want, there, Dennis, or, or you can come back to me later in the call. That, those are the questions sure. I have now. That'd be great. Thanks, Mark. The next question comes from Ben Fan with BMO. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks. Good morning. Um, uh, you, have, you have some comments on how you expect to achieve growth, and, and one of your comments was was not look to, to transformational M&A. And I'm, I'm just curious: is that is that just really a, a reflection of, of where your stock is is trading today? It's it's hard to to, to do M&A in, in, in a big way. Um, or is it is it more you you feel confident in those other two pillars that that two percent rate based growth uh, will start to to gain some traction as the as as your core businesses in Alberta in particular are going to ramp up in a couple of years ahead? Yeah. Um, uh, good morning and, and thanks, Ben. Uh, if you're looking at at the stock price, maybe it's uh, kind of like our price relative to the price that. Uh, uh, Utilities are going for if they're going for up to two times rate base. It's really uh, kind of in absolute and relative terms, they're uh, pretty expensive right now. So we're not looking to uh, to to go that way. The regulated pillars, as you referred to them, with that two percent uh, rate base growth, while um, not at the uh, not at the levels we we saw during the the transmission big build that was. That drove a lot of the uh, that increase. We really see that um, that growth as uh, 
kind of our anchor tenant in order to help drive uh, growth in the uh, energy uh, infrastructure renewables, non-regulated uh, side of the business. And there's uh, very little, I don't think it makes the rounding on the $3.2 billion of CapEx for the next three years. It's pretty much entirely on the utility side. Um, we haven't put anything in that capital commitment for you know things like um, the Australia pumped hydro or other uh, capital associated with some of our other irons in the fire that we have, given that we're not um, uh, we haven't announced those projects. Okay. Um, and maybe when you you, you think with the small scale acquisitions, I, I'm thinking that's, that's more pioneer and. And maybe you include the Palm Padre one that you, you did that's, that's more development. So can, can you share the really thought process around is that is it mostly just in the, your core geographies you're, you're looking at? You need it to be accreted in, in the first year, maybe contacts on, on size. What's your definition of, of small scale? Um, well, the, the pioneers, um, we'll say that's just like a, a natural extension to our utility assets. And while that's a, kind of a, an acquisition, it's, a, I, I, don't, I don't wanna say it's a, it's a no brainer. I mean, because we are looking to um, diversify geographically. You know, this is a, a, a gas asset in Alberta. Um, it comes with a zero premium. Um, and we just fold that into our existing operating footprint. Uh, so it, the 100 kilometers is in our operating footprint. Um, so we, uh, we we believe that that's uh, rightfully falls to the gas our gas transmission company based on the integration agreement that we have with Nova. <clears throat> um, so that's you know whether it's a, a small acquisition or just an extension of our utility growth. Um, in terms of uh, opportunistic M and A, you know, we're not necessarily looking for kind of that in-year accretive. You know, we're looking to build for the long term. You know, we acquired the the pump hydro rights um, for a small undisclosed amount of money, um, and that uh, that has the potential to drive earnings, as I mentioned earlier in the back half of this decade. So we're really focused on the long-term uh, growth uh, being driven from the renewables side of the house. Okay. Um, we also, maybe sorry, maybe. We also, so, sorry, Ben, the, the other element is, is Luma. You know, we have a, a half year worth of earnings in 2021 and the con contract amounts are included in the, uh, in the MDNA and as we ramp up to full operations that will help to support the um, the increased growth in earnings. Yeah, because there's there's that that base two two percent rate base, and you got got these other supplementary earnings mm -hmm. drivers. And let uh, me just close up to loop on on an M and A. Uh, is would you have viewed the Apple Gas Australia acquisition as as large scale uh, back then ten years ago? I mean, is that would you, would you have characterized that as large scale for you? Uh, yeah, a, a billion dollars 10 years ago would have been large scale for us. Okay. All right, got it. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Ben. The next question comes from Patrick Kenny with National Bank Financial. Please go ahead. Yeah, good morning, Dennis. Um, I was just curious what you're hoping to see come out of the Alberta Hydrogen Roadmap this spring. Uh, what near-term opportunities you might be looking to sanction within the energy infrastructure segment, um, as well as potentially any upside to the capital outlook for the distribution business. And I guess related to that is curious if, if you think it makes sense to build the blue hydrogen production facilities effectively on site of the power plant. So, you know, I, I guess at the end of the, the natural gas pipeline, such as your, your Pemina Key Pills line, or do you think over time it makes more sense to, you know, build more of a production hub closer to the storage caverns in Fort Saskatchewan and then, you know, build dedicated hydrogen pipelines to the power plants and other end users? Yeah. Um, 
thanks, Pat, and, and good morning. Yeah, I think in terms of what uh, kind of would, would make more sense would probably be that uh, the latter scenario that you're uh, that you referred to in uh, Fort Saskatchewan, where uh, you know with hydrogen production there we uh, would be the you know we'd like to think that we're the, the natural storage and uh, transmission provider um, of that uh, of that blue hydrogen. Um, We've got uh, four caverns operational, one under construction, um, and room for, uh, for for dozens more. Um, so we, we are exploring that uh, uh, hydrogen development here in uh, in Alberta kind of very seriously. So we really do see that as a um, not a, a great potential, not only for uh, you know hydrogen blending into the, the distribution system uh, to lower the greenhouse gases, um, which we do have that uh, pilot project that we're, that we're doing right now in that forest, Fort Sask area, um, but also to a greater extent throughout, uh, throughout Atco Gas's footprint, so. Okay, no, that's great color. And then maybe switching over to Luma, outside of your counterparties, um, debt restructuring there. Can you just clarify how your contract might be backstopped by the um, the uh, emergency funding that was approved by the previous U.S. administration last fall? And and just um, if you have any insights into if that funding has been reaffirmed by the new administration. Yeah, I, I don't think... Um, I, I don't think it's been uh, reaffirmed by the Biden uh, administration uh, I, I do know that uh, FEMA has uh, has never backed down on its committed funding, um, even with changes in uh, in the, the presidency. That um, that uh, roughly ten billion dollars um, from from FEMA goes to reconstruction of the Puerto Rican electric system. That was damaged by uh, by the hurricanes. That 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 money necessarily isn't uh, kind of backstop our agreement. But one of the conditions, you know, for that to receive that money is that uh, a private operator needs to be in the in the chair. Um, the Federal Oversight Management Board (FOMB) are very supportive of uh, of us and of um, you know, uh, having that private operator go in to uh, really remediate that system and uh, and get it to uh, approaching world class, and that's going to take a number of number of years, given the state of disrepair that that system is in right now. Okay, that's helpful. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks, Pat. The next question comes from Andrew Kuski with Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Thanks. Good morning. Uh, Dennis, I think you mentioned earlier on in the call that you've, you've spent many years really honing your craft of long linear infrastructure. And I guess if we look back over the last, we can pick any time frame, 10, 20, 30 years, um, all the heavy lifting you did in Alberta to really keep up with the pace of growth in the province. And now you're at this juncture where growth looks like it's flattening out. And I guess there's a bit of a duality to the question. Are you seeing any signs of green shoots in Alberta? And then maybe the the other aspect of this question is, you know, given what you did in Alberta over all those years, is that a great calling card for you to execute in certain projects and RFPs like you did with Puerto Rico? Um, yeah, uh, great question, Andrew. And you can see in the MDNA over the uh, over the next few years, we are forecasting our transmission, you know, the from the big build of just over five billion dollars in assets, you know, it's 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 built and with the depreciation burn, it's pretty much offsetting the, the capex. So you see that flat over the next few years. So you know, while there's uh, green shoots um, in in Alberta, we don't really see too much of that impacting the uh, our electricity transmission business, which you know, at five five out of thirteen for our uh, 
our utility rate base here in Alberta, that's a, that's, that's, that's a big anchor. It's uh, spinning off great uh, cash flows right now, but you know we don't anticipate uh, uh, meaningful transmission development you know over you know for the next 10 years because the the grid's been built to accommodate uh, you know the interconnection of renewables uh, and and so on we, we do see uh, uh, some pickup on our uh, customer requests coming from our our gas business those on the dist distribution side it, it really seems to track with uh, GDP so as the as the Alberta GDP goes, um, that's what we would expect to see our electricity and gas business uh, growing by. All else being equal, um, you know, not not including hydrogen for uh, for our gas or kind of like the the grid modernization and strategic improvements that we need to do to the electricity grid to enable uh, you know distributed systems. Uh, smart uh, energy networks and what have you. So we've got the GDP, but we also have some, uh, we'll call them strategic investments that we need to do on the on the distribution side. And that goes to to our calling card and uh, and your and your bang on. You know our performance um, over the last number of decades, where we continually uh, improve on our operations our efficiencies um, you know that uh, was uh, uh, great for the resume that uh, we think helped put us over the top on the on the Puerto Rico contract so we're, we're digesting that right now and uh, it's a lot of heavy lifting to get through the transition uh, agreement and then would uh, sorry the transition time frame uh, and then you know we can uh, we can look to apply those operatorship uh, type skills to other uh, potential opportunities, whether they exist now or whether we can go out and create them. That, that, that's very helpful. And then maybe just following up on the operatorship side of things, with what we've seen in Alberta uh, year to date with cold weather, uh, the market transition into you know different kind of market versus the PPA, the legacy PPA system. Could you maybe talk a little bit about just the resiliency of the system and how things held up and were there any surprises with just the new market construct and the opening up of the market again? Uh, on the electricity side? Yes. You're talking about? Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, everything held in, uh, uh, held up really, really well. I was reading on the ISO website the other day, there's a uh, kind of a, an outage on the, one of the, the tie lines coming in from BC, and they said, "Don't worry, it's not like Texas." Um, so you know, compare compare us. I mean, we were we're built for uh, we're built for the for the cold weather. Um, the system held up. Pool prices obviously went went up, um, but uh, but it but it held up uh, very well. Our distribution system. Uh, electricity transmission there there wasn't a hitch um, and given that we're, we're built for it it's kind of in our DNA on the gas distribution side as well where our uh, our people uh, performed fantastically you know they they're uh, a lot of, a lot of pride and admiration for uh, for the, our, our folks on the tools in order to keep the compression up uh, all of the system planning and response that, that we have um, kind of really uh, really shone through uh, under the radar, I'm going to say, because it's, uh, it's come to be expected that the, uh, our, our homes will be heated, and, and that's exactly what we continue to deliver. A bit of a rah-rah call-out, shout-out for our gas distribution guys. They, uh, yeah. I, I'm glad I wasn't out there in the minus 40 yeah, it's the uh, un unsung heroes on the op side, but uh, thank you for the comments. Thanks, Andrew. Once again, if anyone on the conference call who wishes to ask a question may press star 1 at this time. The next question comes from Maurice Choi with RBC Capital Markets. Please go ahead. 
Thanks, and good morning. Um, my first question, uh, I want to just come back to the capital deployment um, bit. Um, if you look back at last year, uh, there was obviously a benefit of maintaining financial flexibility amidst the pandemic. Um, do you see yourself tilting more now towards deployment, or um, is there still quite a considerable benefit of keeping this flexibility? And if it is indeed uh, more towards deployment, is it fair to say that many of your initiatives are more towards sowing the seeds for future deployment, uh, like the pump hydro, like the hydrogen, rather than uh, investing in operational assets today? Um, uh, good morning. Thanks, thanks, Maurice. Uh, yeah, we're. Um, I don't know. We're. I don't know if anyone's ever out of the woods from from COVID. You know, we uh, we do still have the and the and the global economic turmoil that's uh, that it left in its in its wake. Um, we. Uh, I love the financial flexibility. It uh, it helps us on the credit metric sides. Um, you are you're correct in noting the uh, kind of the longer term uh, project view. We've, we we have a long track record of our uh, greenfield developments. You know we 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 built up our our international power generation business. Um, most of it uh, disposed of in um, in 2019 there, but we we still have that uh, greenfield uh, development. Uh, Sorry, recognition that the greenfield development will lead to uh, probably higher uh, long-term value for our share owners. We're not turning our back on um, kind of operating assets where we uh, are, can use that to accelerate uh, market entry into a, into a region. Uh, acquiring late-stage uh, development projects um, that have been somewhat de-risked, but not all the way through, can help, uh, we'll call that uh, middle ground, where we can have some uh, nearer term earnings, maybe not uh, instant uh, accretive uh, operational earnings, but would come with a, a much shorter uh, development timeline that uh, we talked about earlier with the Australian pumped hydro example. Great, and if I could just switch gears to Puerto Rico, I, I, I recognize all the comments um, and all the questions uh, earlier about um, the contract, but could you, um, you know, share any thoughts on what uh, perhaps the steering committee formed by the governor, the new governor, uh, to review the O&M contract uh, could lead to, have you, have you engaged discussions with, uh, with them? Um, yeah, I mean, the uh, governor issued an executive order in January, you know, and uh, that supports the contract and uh, did establish that steering committee to um, to help shepherd Luma into commencement. So looking at things like uh, in, ensuring some fundamental, a couple of fundamental principles like stable utility rates and um, you know, I mentioned earlier in the call that we filed our application with the, the PREB that, that didn't have any increase in, to, in the utility rates, along with a system remediation plan that, um, that will help to drive down costs long term um, for, for customers. So that, that was uh, one fundamental principle, stable rates. And the second one was continued employment of the utility workers. Uh, and we, are, we are in the process of uh, on our recruitment drive as the as employees would move from uh, prepa into luma the affected employees that choose or are not offered oppor an opportunity with luma uh, do have um, you know, by law um, employment with the government of puerto rico so we think that continued employment um, is a is a check as well um, and given all of the, uh, I don't know, the uh, legal, political uh, charts that we charted 
waters that we need to go through. The steering committee, you know, we uh, we really view as an ally to help get us to our targeted June 1 commencement. Fantastic. Great color. Thank you very much. Thanks, Maurice. The next question comes from Elias Foskulis with Industrial Alliance Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning. Uh, just two questions. Um, you uh, <clears throat> applied to defer the rate increases uh, in Alberta. While I uh, realize that's not going to have a, an earnings impact, it, it will have a uh, cash flow or funds flow impact. Can you, uh, um, you know, I guess confirm that that this is really not going to be that material that it would impact uh, credit metrics. Um, thanks, Elias, for the for the question. I mean, uh, we uh, we didn't take it lightly. You know, our our customers and Alberta right now are uh, hurting as a result of COVID. Um, given the rate increases that we're facing, our uh, electricity and gas distribution utilities. Um, we believe that it was the, the right thing to do for our customers long term. Uh, you're right that it will not affect earnings, but it does uh, affect cash flow. Um, we will be filing our application uh, next week, um, outlining the, the, the quantums and potential recovery periods for, for that cash deferral. It is not, uh, you know, overly material. You know, if you look at our uh, cash flow from operations in the uh, for CE 1.6, 1.7 billion dollar range, um, so it's uh, it's less than if materiality in my mind. The, the hurdle is 10 percent. It'll be less than 10 percent, I suspect, of our overall cash flows. But you know, we've um, you know, in discussions with the rating agencies, they it is uh, it would be a timing issue purely. So we don't think that we'd be unduly penalized in uh, in one year for uh, for something where we have the, the remaining balance sheet uh, strength in order to to back up the uh, kind of A range credit metrics where we're where we're at right now. Okay. I thanks very much for that color. I, I appreciate it. Um, and and yeah I agree it's uh, it's you know, it's just a, a one-year thing with, uh, you know, a clear line of sight to catch up. Um, the, the last question, and focusing a bit uh, on, on Mark's question earlier about natural gas distribution, um, I'll, I'll just try to simplify it a bit um, because it caught me off guard. Uh, we can expect to see a tailwind um, from, you know, uh, the efficiencies uh, into 2021 with that likely dissipating by 2022 would would that be a good way to view it yeah i i think those um uh that that if you're talking about tailwinds and timings to 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 mark's questions i mean some of some of those costs uh planned programs that we had in 2020 some of those got deferred so uh, we're not I don't want to say kicking costs down the road, but uh, there's some elements of our O&M programs that we weren't able to get to in 2020, which we would see coming through in 2021. So, so a little bit of uh, a little bit of headwinds uh, for gas distribution in 2021 compared to where they were in 2020. Okay, thank you very much for that clarity because I maybe wasn't listening to it correct. That's it for me. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks very much, Lars. This concludes the question and answer session. I would like to turn the conference back over to Mr. Miles Dugan for any closing remarks. Well, thank you, Anastasia, and thank you all for participating today. We appreciate your interest in Canadian utilities and we look forward to speaking with you again soon. This concludes today's conference call. You may disconnect your lines. Thank you for participating and have a pleasant day.